Hello everybody, Jeff here with Accurate Rifles and Restorations. Today we've got a relatively new action uh, to kind of unbox and uh, kind of go through. Um, it's e, uh, EVO, EVO, as in Evolution 2. <clears throat> this is made by Mac Brothers. This is how it was shipped. Um, so they have their own branded tape. That's pretty impressive. It's not cheap. Uh, nice box, nothing flashy there, uh, but it is nice to see their logo on there um, with the uh, branded tape like that. Uh, shipped directly to me. Um, Sturgis, South Dakota. Sturgis, South Dakota is where this was from. Mac Brothers, that is. So, um, as, as you see, this is how it came. <clears throat> Got some paperwork in there for the FFL transfer work and all that good stuff. And even a little hand note, handwritten, handwritten uh, thank you letter here from my customer, Sean. So thank you. Action for Sean. Uh, and thanks again there, handwritten. So that's pretty nice. There's still personal touch out there with some businesses. So that's, that's pretty nice. So the uh, Evo 2. So technically this is their, <clears throat> excuse me, Evo TI. TI Titanium. Long action titanium, uh, made in the USA Mac Brothers. Titanium, magnum bolt face. Uh, it's cut for a BDL, and it's a long action. This particular action, uh, my customer wants a 300 H and H Magnum, so that's what we're going to give them. Uh, inside the box, right off the bat, you've got a little pamphlet, uh, color glossy, nice, nicely printed pamphlet uh, with some warranty, disclaimer of liability, tenant specifications, uh, bolt instructions, uh, instructions on how to take it apart. Uh, there is a toolless design for the firing pin assembly. And then apparently you can ex remove the extractor by jamming a screwdriver in there and prying it out. I probably won't be doing that uh, just to avoid marring anything and pretty much unnecessary to do for me. Uh, but you can do it. Uh, there's another thank you for your purchase, a uh, number to call, an email address, and then some social media. Uh, necessary stuff there, and then uh, a little bit more uh, information. Okay, so that out of the way, open up this part, and I think, yep, there's a sticker in here too. So you get a uh, nice little sticker, Mac Brothers logo, and uh, it's like some kind of armored knight holding a sword. So there's that. And then uh, no frills in the box, really. I mean, you get this nice uh, custom cut or laser cut uh, squishy foam. Um, definitely protecting the action, the context of the box. And basically what you see is what you get. <clears throat> the action itself and your bolt handle. <clears throat> okay, so there's nothing under here. I've already looked. Uh, like I said, no frills on the box, packaging, whatnot. But uh, here it is, the uh, Mac Brothers. Make sure you can see that, okay. Okay, so very lightweight. The uh, impression I get right off the bat is, you know, when I pulled this out of the box, I almost hit myself in the face, it was so light. I was uh, expecting light, but geez. This is right up there with the Anti-X and everything like that. So just, uh, just to complete the package, I'm going to screw that handle on. Okay, so uh, we've got standard Remington 700 uh, footprint. So I guess we'll just start here. I will get the bolt. Um, side bolt release, side bolt stop. So to release, one would just push button, and that would release the bolt. Okay, so working our way... I guess front to back, we've got a recoil lug. Um, it appears to be separate, although it is 
it, if it's pinned. So I'm not real sure on that. Um, yeah, I think we'll just leave that on there. So it's, uh, it's curious because on the outside, um, let me grab a set of calipers here. On the outside, you know, you've got, what is this? Quarter inch, a quarter inch, uh, what appears to be a separate recoil lug. However, on the inside, see if you can see that, it's, uh, I don't know, it appears to be, I don't know if that's pressed on there or what the heck that is. But it really, I mean, it does not feel loose whatsoever. And I'm certainly not going to force it off. So we're just going to leave that there. So anyway, a quarter inch uh, recoil lug, I assume is made of titanium as well. Again, I'm very, very impressed with how lightweight this is. Um, you know, separate Picatinny rail here. Uh, it is removable. It looks like some maybe T20, T25 Torx nuts or uh, screws holding on uh, two sections of, I reckon, uh, aluminum Picatinny rail. They are removable, so you could, uh, I assume that's probably a Remington footprint, so you could swap that, swap that out for a uh, full-length pick rail or uh, separate rings or, you know, whatever you, whatever you desire in there for your scope mounting abilities. The uh, front action screw hole is where it should be. Uh, vent, <clears throat> uh, gas vent there. Uh, very nice, high-quality looking machined surfaces. Everything's flat. The bolt abutments in the back look very, very nice. Um, so, very impressive there. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is a BDL cut. So, an er internal box magazine system would be, would be the choice for this. Um, usually, you can run a box mag with these kind of things, too. Uh, but that's what that is. So, moving back. Um, you know, obviously, it's plenty of cut out here for the uh, big old 300 H&H &H Magnum. Uh, your bolt release is just simply pinned in with a roll pin there. Trigger hanger. Um, those are very popular these days. And it's probably a 332nd <clears throat> wrench. Nope, it's a little smaller. Hopefully it's not metric. There we go. Okay. So what is this? Five sixty fourths. Five sixty fourths wrench for the trigger hanger. And for those of you unfamiliar with the trigger hanger, <laughs> really all it is is literally a bracket that one would uh, put the pins in there. Uh, for your Remington style trigger and then so you install it in the bracket and then it's got a little lip right there that hides under there um I'm struggling here huh? I can't get it back in I don't know if this pin is kind of going on here. Well, come on. You just came out. Is it the screw? Okay, it's the screw. <laughs> that little screw was screwing with me. So once the trigger's installed in the bracket, you, there's a little lip here under there, and then it swings down, and then you secure it with this little set screw. Uh, I don't really know the big benefit of that <laughs> i guess if a guy had a whole bunch of triggers he liked to swap out quickly that would be a, a good thing so maybe you got a timney and a jewel and a trigger tech and a Vix and andy and a <laughs> maybe you know, you use one for hunting and one for match shooting i i don't know exactly the reason behind these trigger hangers but they are quite popular and you know what why, why not why not and Fire and safe for your safety. 
just the typical prints printing there. And uh, I guess that's about it there. So there's your action. Um, one thing here, my customer sent me a stock to install this in, which of course I don't have available. I didn't prepare for this video very well. Uh, but um, trial fitting, everything fit fine except for this little screw. So there's um, a bedding block in this stock. It's actually a really pretty stock. You'll see it later on in this video series. Um, but uh, this is uh, interfering with that block, which is not a problem. I'll just cut, I'll just simply cut a little radii out there with, the, with an end mill out of the aluminum, and then it'll fit fine. Without the trigger hanger in there, it, it sits in there fine. Um, so it'll just be a minor little alteration to the bedding block in the stock to get that to fit. Uh, I guess back to the recoil log, it's got uh, angled, kind of angled surfaces there. Again, just probably make it look fancier. Really no purpose there. In fact, I'd kind of rather see just a full recoil log, but nonetheless, it's, it's fine. So, uh, moving on to the bolt. Black, probably a DLC. I would reckon that's a DLC co a coating, diamond light coating. Or nitrated. I don't know. I'm not an expert on that stuff. Um, but it's a uh, kind of the idea here. You already saw the bolt knob, or the, the entire handle, actually, is threaded in there. So I would be sure to lock tight that in there uh, when I... If I were the owner of this, I'll, I'll check with the customer. If he wants me to lock tight it, I'll do that for him. Um, but I, uh, I haven't been on Mac Brothers site, but I reckon they probably have a whole bunch of different bolt, uh, bolt knobs for this, or bolt handles, I guess it would be, for their, uh, for their actions. There'd be no other reason to unscrew that. Um, Toolless uh, removal of the firing pin assembly. Uh, so typically, like a lot of these nowadays, you would, uh, unscrew this actually cl clockwise. See if I can get it. Yeah. So you'd screw that. It, um, comes out of its little notch inside the, these two little cams, uh, release, and then the entire thing comes out. Uh, pretty impressive looking firing pin. There's a nice layer of grease on everything. Uh, the... <clears throat> the uh, spring is not uh, snaking uh, around the pin, so that uh, doesn't interfere with the forward travel of everything. Uh, keeps uh, ignition and the entire system uh, a lot more uh, consistent, shot to shot. So that's nice to see. Uh, it's a very, fairly powerful spring, probably 26-ish pounds, something like that, which is pretty typical. Um, the uh, bolt face, so there's your hybrid kind of M16 style looking extractor. It's got extremely long, I'm sh I guess this is a spring. Let's see if I got something soft here. Yeah, so that pivots away to capture the rim of the case. And then this is just a probably a leaf style spring that's tensioning it forward to, to keep it down, to, to keep hold of that case. Uh, I don't have any 300 H&H &H cases right now to put in there, but it is a magnum size. And typical spring-loaded ejector on the bolt face itself, uh, like a Remington would be. And then there's a roll pin, cross pin holding that in. Okay, so there, roll pin, holding in your ejector, followed by its spring. So very easy removal there, it does require a tool, but not very often a guy has to remove his ejector. <clears throat> Okay, so like I said, the uh, instructions show uh, using a screwdriver to pry that um, extractor out. Again, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I actually like the extractor being in there because it helps with the go gauges when I'm checking. 
the bell. And it does not interfere, so no sweat. Um, I'm not, not going to disassemble this entire thing either. But it looks like we got a set screw. So I reckon you probably back that out. There's probably another screw underneath it, which releases this whole thing. Not real sure on that, but, uh, you know, if a guy really wanted to take that apart, he could. Okay, so that's basically the action. The Tenet itself <clears throat> is very similar to a Remington style, you know, one and one sixteenth, uh, major diameter, 16 threads per inch, a one inch even tolerance negative 3 thousandths for your uh, relief. <clears throat> Looks like you got a relief in the back and about a 16th inch relief on the front. Uh, so a little bit of relief cut before the threads and a little relief on the back end. It doesn't call out a dimension for the back end. Um, there is a recoil lug there with probably plenty of clearance. So there's no threads there and it's 1.065 ish. So yeah, the um there shouldn't there's no um need for a, a relief at the very back end of your thread tenon. <clears throat> so that's probably optional. Some gunsmiths like to cut this relief here so when they're threading down they have a place to kind of stop reliably if they're a little bit green on the controls or whatever they can they can stop the machine here i like to thread just i'm not going fast by any means but i'm not going slow but i'll, I'll just thread and i'll pull the tool out as i disengage so that it, it looks nice it looks more professional and in this kind of situation, you don't need a relief groove there anyway. More steel. And uh, the other benefit, if, if you want to, so if he shoots his throat out, <clears throat> we can back this up simply by picking up that thread, moving all these features back until we got a fresh, clean uh, throat there. So um, typical Remington, recess style uh, breech. Recesses of uh, 705. That's, uh, again, typical of a Remington. The uh, depth is 155. That's pretty typical as well. Thread tendon length overall is 940. And measuring this, <clears throat> it is actually 943 from, so if the bolt's in there, put it in there upside down, dummy. 943 from the face, from your recoil lug face, to the lug, to the recoil to the bolt log, at least, that is, back here. So it's 943. Their drawing calls out 940. In uh, this case, uh, I, speaking with a customer, I think down the road he is going to want to switch barrels on this thing. So I'm going to machine it to the specifications called out for on the uh, tenon print that they provide. I would uh, normally measure everything with a depth micrometer very accurately. So these numbers are a little bit off, but headspace will still, I think with this, with these numbers here, I don't think, but that's where zero is. That's where your headspace is. The cartridge is going to sit dead flat nuts with this, uh, with the uh, end of the barrel tenon. And so in this guy's case, uh, he sends me a barrel. I cut it to the same dimensions. He can switch them out as long as he has the proper vise and uh, wrenches and things. Right, so very straightforward there. Um, no frills or nothing there. If you've done a Remington, you can do one of these, no problem. Okay, so that's the action. Let's kind of set these things aside. Now, along with the uh, Mac Brothers titanium action, we have another proof research barrel. This is a 30 cal. Obviously, that would be ideal for a 300 H&H &H Magnum. A 1 and 9 twist. Stainless steel with a beautiful carbon wrap. 
I still feel like Proof Research makes uh, some of the best carbon wrap barrels. They look awesome. They shoot awesome. This one is 26 inches from the uh, where the breech will be to the end of the crown. This section, as always, will be uh, cut off and discarded. Um, this is actually kind of fortuitous for me because my lathe is uh, massive. My headstock is extremely long. So what I'll do is keep this stub on there so that way I can center this proper without having to use a bushing or a barrel extension on the threads or, or something weird like that. So I, <clears throat> there are workarounds for my long head sock, but uh, I always really prefer to hold the back end of the spider and the front end of a four jaw chuck. And that way I can articulate this thing, get it centered in um, off the bore. Um, I always give my customers the option. We've got the uh, <clears throat> aligned chamber to curvature the bore. That's option number one. That's the premium option. Um, that's, I guess to put it, for those familiar, it's the Gordy Gritters method that he kind of developed, which is actually, who cares what's going on back here? We're centering right in this area where the throat and the neck kind of transitions to the rifling. So we're getting everything trued up and straight and aligned right here. The other benefit of that is once you have this aligned in the front using a long reach indicator and two points of dialing in, your, uh, the back end of the barrel is going to be swinging cattywampus, like undoubtedly because there's always some curvature to that bore. So the benefit of that technique is you can align. So once you get that uh, receiver torqued, well, basically you figure out your high spot. So where the barrel is actually kind of pointing up, you would mark a T for top. And then as you machine that tenon, you would machine it so the shoulder so the action torques onto the shoulder at that high spot. It takes a lot more time. Um, again, it's an option. My particular customer, this is a hunting rig. He does want an accurate rifle. I mean, that's no doubt. But he doesn't feel like the extra expense and time is worth it for this situation. I agree. I always offer it. I mean, I got hunter customers that want the absolute best. No, no corners cut, no questions asked. So the other option is, like I mentioned earlier, we're just going to center it off the bore from the breech end to the chamber end, which means that curvature is going to be somewhere in the middle, but both of these ends are going to be perfectly concentric and square in the world. Again, um, pick your poison, really. If you got the funds and you want me to do it, we'll, we'll do it however you want. That, uh, that being said, there's no, uh, no corners cut on my end. I'm still checking everything every step of the way. So I'll get the centered up. I'll face this off. So there's a little um, protrusion or a boss sticking out there. So we'll get this face flat when it's, when it's spinning concentric. This will be the first operation. Face that off. Stick my dial indicator back in there. Check it again. Make sure that it didn't bump it or uh, move or anything in the chuck. Move on to the next operation, which is usually turning down. You know, so I'll lay out my thread 10 in length, and then we'll turn down the diameter. Halfway through there, again, stick the indicator in, check it. Ensure nothing's moved. Finish diameter. That would be 1 and 1 16th. <clears throat> then, uh, again, re check it, recheck, thread it. Halfway through, check it. Once threading is complete and this uh, receiver screws on, um, in this case, we don't have a high side to worry about, but if uh, we were doing the premium one, I would clock it, meaning cut the shoulder back and back until that receiver screws on to right where I want it, uh, top dead center of the barrel. Uh, so cutting the shoulder uh, indexes the receiver proper and also provides a perfectly square surface to torque onto. We'll check contact. We'll check to make sure there's no light gap or any kind of 
uh, inconsistency in the contact of the barrel to the recoil lugger. Once all that's kosher, you guessed it, we stick a dial indicator in there, check it again. Make sure everything's still spinning straight and true. If anything is getting out of whack, something's wrong because you'll see on my way that I've got one of the largest chucks you can freaking get. Um, so if something's shifting in there, especially that often, it's time to kind of investigate something. But never assume. Always, always check things. So once all that's finished, we'll cut the recess for the bolt. You know, get the uh, get the bolt to fit. So inside the end of the barrel, there will be a little uh, recess cut. Once that's cut to depth and diameter, we'll screw this back on, make sure the bolt closes with a little bit of that forward and aft uh, movement. We want a little bit of that for clearance. So we want to see that as this is torqued onto the, bolt, or the barrel. We still, we still want to see that tiny bit, usually 8 thousandths of travel here, 8 to 10 thousandths. Once all that's kosher, we'll go ahead and work on the chamber. Um, again, checking the entire time. We will uh, pre-drill most of that out, bore it out with a high-speed <clears throat> high operation, uh, low depth of cut, high speed, high, PR, high RPM, and slow feed. That will just make sure the walls of the chamber or the pre-cut chamber are true, square, concentric. And so as the actual finish reamer comes in and cuts the chamber, it's not fighting a drill cut where it's all nasty and trying to find center the whole time and, and all that. Just gives the reamer a nice, a much nicer surface to work from and makes the whole operation just better overall. There will be a trigger tech special installed under this. So that's where you'll see the uh, trigger hanger in action a little uh, later on down the road. So yeah, that's, uh, that's everything there. The only other thing I do, um, without ever skimping or fail, without fail, is a uh, bore scope. Or not bore scope, uh, the bore. Always check. You can't see in there with your naked eye, so I want to make sure the rifling's good. The bore looks good. There's no uh, scratches or gouges. I have seen a few in my time. Um, I won't name names or brands, but I've had three barrels where I found problems in the bore. The first one, I had already machined the barrel. So shame on me. That was my fault. A bunch of labor wasted. The company did replace the barrel. They made good on it. So good. So ever since then, I've bore scoped before anything else. No, no metal, no material will be cut until we know damn sure that this bore is good. All right. So very simple. Um, I've showed this in other videos on the channel, but uh, simply just going to uh, poke it out with a patch. There's probably dust and some manufacturing stuff left in there. Don't want any false readings on the bore scope. So no solvents or nothing, just a dry patch. Um, and then I got my bore scope. So mine's a digital bore scope. It works with a laptop or a cell phone or a, a tablet, basically just a USB um, camera on a flexible shaft. It's made by Teslong. So plenty of, length, plenty of length. And then you've got your um, USB adapter here that plugs into your device, whatever you're looking at. So basically, it's a 45 degree angled mirror. So there's a camera that just shoots forward, and then the mirror helps it see the walls of the chamber, which you will see momentarily here. So basically, like I showed you, I poke it out with a patch, clean it, just blow out the crap, anything that might be in there, and then I'll feed it in like this, all the way to the end, all the way to the muzzle. When I get to the end, I'll rotate it 90 degrees, pull it back. Once I get to the breech end, rotate it 90 again, push it all the way forward. Once I get to the muzzle end, rotate it that final 90 and then pull it back. That way I see the entire 360 degree uh, rotation of the, of the bore. So I always start on the top or just with the mirror facing up just so I know where I'm starting and I just religiously go to the, to the left. 
right? So feeding it in. Everything's looking nice. Kind of hard to keep it steady, but. So that's, uh, that's what you want to see with a brand new match grade barrel. <clears throat> These are cut rifled and hand lapped, which is evident here in the finish. There's some minor stuff right there. I mean, that'll get, that's nothing to worry about there. That's just some very minor. And plus this is magnifi magnified, so it's gonna exaggerate anything. A little, little, little smuts in the grooves, but really, again, it's nothing as bad as I've seen these other barrels I mentioned earlier. So we're getting close to the end. Feeding in, feeding in. <clears throat> okay, so there's the end of the muzzle. So as I said, we're just going to rotate it 90 degrees. And this is the, the section well past where we're going to cut it off. So that's, that's all going to be gone. So I don't even care about that. I don't even care an inch back from that. So as I said, pull it back, back, back. Yeah, everything's looking nice in here. Okay. <clears throat> so before I even started shooting this video, I actually bore scoped this. So I just wanted to show you the technique I use. Um, I know this, I verified this is good already, so um, we won't take up any more time here with that. <clears throat> All right, so barrel's good. Actually, I'm going to write on this so I don't forget. It might be another day or two till I get to it. Bore good. Okay, so <clears throat> the only thing next is to fill out my data sheet again, like I always do with everything, my uh, spec sheet, as it were, but uh, this will be all completely filled out. A lot of these are known and given dimensions and numbers and things, <clears throat> simply because Mac Brothers gives them to you. Um, so I've already walked through this whole form that I, that I do. You just have to watch another chambering video to find all that good stuff out. But uh, just a CYA kind of thing. For my records, for the customer, and any, you know, if he down the road decides to go to a different gunsmith and wants him to do something to this rifle, at least they have that information. So. Anyway, uh, we'll cut this here. Uh, I'll probably show a little bit of the lathe work. Uh, Sean wants to see see some of this process and share it with some of his buddies. So I may get some more jobs out of it. And uh, you too. So, you know, you see what you like. At the end of the video or in the description, you're going to see uh, my website address. So don't hesitate. I'm definitely for hire. Um, I'm not the cheapest guy in the world. Uh, but I have a very short wait list right now. Um, I'm busy, but uh, I'm only weeks out right now as opposed to months, so it was a good time to get, uh, get, get in touch. Uh, things are getting busier and busier all the time, obviously, um, as things progress and stuff. So uh, if, you have the, if you have the components, if you have the barrel, especially the barrel, those are really hard to get right now, actions and barrels. So if you have the components and you can ship them to me, I'll have it back to you in probably three weeks, sometimes quicker.
all three in the same hole i'm going to shoot three just rapid sequence uh just to get them on paper and get my velocities and we'll score the velocities after So this letter B is the three shot group that you saw me put down, uh, 32, 73, 32, 69, and I think 3301 were the velocities on these three. That's at 100 yards. These are one inch squares and I'm sighted roughly an inch high and I'm holding bottom left corner. So I'm, I'm sighted about an inch and a half high at 100. Uh, which should ballistically put me very close to dead on at 200. Uh, and then beyond that, the rifle scope that I put on there is a Zeiss HD5, uh, 5 to 25. At the ballistics that Zeiss recommends, I think I'm shooting it at 23 and a half magnification for that 165 grain Nosler Acubond. Uh, with that velocity, I should be at 23 and a half magnification according to Zeiss. So that's a pretty good three shot group for not taking my time rushing it as if I was in the field. And I'm gonna be using the Garmin Zero uh, to get my velocities to help with my ballistics information. So here we go. Okay, shot number one to get velocity. Three thousand two hundred and ninety one point five. So I'm going to give you my last five shot group or six shot groups. Thirty two ninety one point five. Thirty two seventy four point two. Thirty three oh one point six. Thirty two sixty nine point nine and thirty two seventy three point three is my last six shots. Five shots. Five or six, whatever I read off. So Jeff, in conclusion, you built an awesome rifle. This 300 Holland Holland, 100 year edition, Super 30. Uh, I mean, everything about it's custom, so I don't even know where to start. I'm sure you'll give all that information in your video. But half inch groups with multiple different loads. Uh, I, I just, I can't imagine ever having a better rifle or more successful build that than what we had so good job anybody out there that's looking to build a rifle i highly recommend jeff uh, i've built numerous rifles over the years and this has got to be the best peace